good morning, North Livingston. It's good to see you all in the house of the Lord this morning. If you would, let's stand as we begin our service with a time of prayer. As we have prayer this morning, we want to uh, uh, pray for our country. Uh, thankful for uh, this Independence Day. Uh, continue to pray for our leadership. Pray for all of those that uh, make decisions. Um, continue to pray for Lynn and Joan. Lynn got a good report this week. Well, uh, it, it better than expected. Uh, we praise the Lord for that. But just continue to pray for them. I think some more testing coming up and then treatment plan. Also, um, uh, remember to pray for uh, Sue. She's got uh, knee surgery coming up. Charlene and David, I think, have a trip coming up uh, for testing and so just remember them, pray for them as they try to find some answers for Charlene. Um, Daryl and Patty, glad Patty's able to be back today. She had a pretty rough week last week. Glad she's feeling better. Continue to remember uh, Daryl's sister and brother-in-law, um, one sister and the other brother-in-law, uh, Kathy. Uh, uh, Kathy uh, has, uh, we have shared, she's got kidney cancer. Uh, but uh, some problems with some medication she's on and so the testing and so they're still trying to work all of that out and that, that's very stressful. Just pray for them as they work that plan out and then Scott, uh, continue to pray for him where he messed the knee up. Uh, just continue to remember that. Uh, also, our neighbor, Kurt McMacken, uh, told us yesterday they think he has prostate cancer, so pray for him. He's trying to get into Dr. Spicer for testing. And their daughter, uh, Tiffany, uh, the age of our girls uh, has breast cancer. They start this week uh, with very aggressive treatment. So uh, it, it's uh, the stage that it is. Her mother told us yesterday that, that, that that's going to be very aggressive treatment this week. So remember Tiffany Jones as you pray also. Do you have updates? Baby Dickerson and her surgery this week. This is Heidi's sister. I talked with her last night. The surgery went well. She, they got all of the tumors that was on the tumor gland. She wanted to thank the church for the prayers. And this is Hazel's sister, right? Okay. All right. Anyone else? Updates? Scott's surgery is on the 20th. If it's surgeon's hip replacement, it's well enough to be in the surgery. Oh, okay. Yeah. And he, he was waiting for surgery and his doctor had surgery. So, um, yeah, one of those bad situations. Continue to pray for. Um, the, the situation in Marion with the water, um, they, were, they were down as of Thursday, I think, to a five-day supply. Uh, the National Guard is there. Some of the local farmers will start helping this week. Uh, they did get rain yesterday, not as much as we got, uh, but they got some rain. Um, I, I'm proud to report that uh, I know how to fix a pond levy. Uh, I, I shared that with you a few weeks ago. Our pond completely filled up in 45 minutes uh, yesterday. Uh, if you see dirt floating down the river, it's mine. <laughs> we, we, we lost a lot of dirt that we had just bought. Uh, but uh, praise the Lord for the rain. It was much needed. But continue to pray for Mary and pray for that leadership. Uh, I, I will add, uh, well, I'll share in just a moment an, an announcement about that. But let's have prayer first. Are there any, any other updates? All right, let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer. Father, we do thank you for this day. God, we thank you for the Lord's day. God, this day, the first day of the week that Jesus came out of the tomb, this first day of the week that you established that the church would gather together. Uh, Father, even, even if that's just tradition, not Bible, but God, what a blessing it is uh, to get to come together, to meet in person, to encourage one another, pray for one another, to, 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 to lift our songs and our, our voice in songs and worship you. And then, Father, to, to share the word. God, we thank you for those that share in our Sunday school, our discipleship. God, how uh, just blessing that has been even this morning. We thank you for that and pray for those teachers. And, and God, just uh, we ask for your, your, your guidance uh, in, in, as we move forward to get things uh, uh, going back on the Wednesday nights. Father, after COVID, God, we pray that you would just help in all of our directions there. Father, we, we, you've heard these names. There's names on our, our prayer list. And God, they're not just names on paper, but Father, to you, each one of these individuals, you know the, the particular concern that they have. Father, Many of them have, have reached out, have sent word and asked somebody from this church and said, would you pray for me? Would you add me to your church's prayer list? Because they, they know that you're a healing God. They have faith in the power of prayer. 
And so, God, we come to you this morning and we, we bring these again, not just names, but, Father, is each one uh, hearing my, my voice right now in this room and by way of Internet, God, is there mentioning those names to you, those family members, those coworkers, those within their circle of influence and, and those particularly dear to them and maybe even them, themselves, they're mentioning that need to you right now. We are so thankful, God, in your wisdom and your power as creator, as God, that you hear all of these prayers at one time, but God, each one is just as important as it is if we were, uh, as the picture you give us, what son goes to his father and asks bread and would he give him a stone? God, you, you're hearing these prayers and they're important to us, so they're important to you. And God, we just, as we name those particularly dear in our family, our situation, our our concern, God, we're thankful that you hear, and God, we just ask that you touch. God, some we ask for, for healing. We know that you put a healing in the atonement. Jesus took those stripes on his back, and, and God, you still perform miracles. You can still speak the word, and healing just comes. And God, we know also that you work through doctors and medicines, and you've blessed us in this country with some of the best. And God, we're grateful for that. So, Father, as we lift these to you today, we just come in faith believing. And we ask that you touch God. There's some on our prayer list today that are, are grieving. They're grieving the loss of a loved one. And God, they need that peace that the scripture, your word describes as a peace that, that just passes our human reasoning, our human understanding, a peace that comes only through you. And God, for those, we ask that you just comfort. And God, that you just, you just grant that peace. Uh, that we see it in our minds, a loving father just reaching his arms out and just hugging a child to bring comfort to God. We ask that for those that are, are bereaved today. God, we ask for leaders in our country, leaders at our local levels, our state level, and our federal level. God, the scripture teaches us that we're to pray for our leaders. And then you tell us that when we pray for our leaders, that the purpose of that is that we could lead a quiet, peaceable life. And God, certainly we all desire quiet, peaceable lives. So God, we pray for our leaders. God, those leaders that know you as Savior that are in that position today, we pray that you would just strengthen them, encourage them. God, give them wisdom and discernment. God, those leaders that don't know you as Savior, God, we ask that, that the Holy Spirit would convict them. God, we spend too much of our time. I spend too much of my time criticizing. And, and God, we need to spend more time praying because they are eternity-bound souls. And again, Jesus died for them. And so, Father, we pray for those leaders. God, we pray for the leadership there in Marion. We pray for the leadership in our state that's taken that situation over. God, how we turn the tap on it. We just take water for granted. And, and Father, now the town is, is not able to take that for granted. And God, we pray that you would just give wisdom. We thank you for the rains from heaven. God, that'll be a reprieve. But God, they need discernment and wisdom as they move forward on this such a basic need that we all take for granted. God, we pray for our time together today. We ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit as Joe and the team comes to lead us in just a moment. Let us just lift our, our hearts towards you, our minds and our thoughts towards you and just worship you in song. And then, Father, I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit as we share in the word in just a moment. God, that you just have your will your way. God, you just challenge us with the word. God, you put a promise on the word. You said it would not return void, but it would accomplish what you've sent it out to do. You have a purpose for that word today. God, don't let me get in the way. God, just set me aside. Just let me be the conduit that you use to speak to every one of us, myself included, in the room and by way of internet today as you just bring that word to life to us. God, again, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for each home that's represented here. We ask a blessing upon those homes. It's in the name of Jesus we pray to all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Pray also for some we have traveling. Um, I have a thank you note I want to share with you from Hazel uh, on the loss of her brother with special thanks to all of you. Uh, to know you is to know people who are kind, considerate, thoughtful. To know you is to be grateful for the special things you do, for everything you've done, for being the special people that you are. Thank you so very much for the memorial gift, Hazel. And we continue to pray for her and her family and the loss of her brother. I want to remind you, um, I think we may have settled on a date for the fish fry. We've been kind of tossing that around. Uh, put on your calendars uh, August the 6th. 
That is a Saturday. Uh, we're going to try to move it up from July to August. We're going to have this uh, uh, try to be in, in conjunction with getting our kids back on Wednesday nights. Uh, school starts in Livingston County on August the 10th. And so that Saturday at 6 o'clock, we're having a community fish fry. Uh, it's been quite a while since we've done that. Uh, but uh, the fish fry will be here at the church on uh, Saturday, August the 6th at 6 o'clock. Um, just desserts and drinks. Um, asking everybody to bring desserts and drinks. And, and people, bring people. Uh, and the church will supply the rest. Um, I want to call your attention to, and you've probably seen it on the overhead, uh, keep in mind coming as we approach November, the elections in Kentucky, uh, we have two amendments on the uh, uh, ballot this year. Uh, we're thankful uh, our Supreme Court has uh, overturned. Uh, they, they didn't do away with Roe v. Wade. All they did was sent Roe v. Wade back to the states, uh, which Roe v. Wade was the abortion uh, uh, decision made in 73, some 50 years ago. Uh, as is in our Constitution, uh, any, any right that's not specifically uh, enumerated in the Constitution belongs to the states. That's what I think it's the 10th Amendment of the Constitution says. And so the, the court just did what the Constitution says they should have done 50 years ago. It goes back to the states. Well, several of the states had a trigger law. They had already written laws. The legislatures had written laws that they would limit, they would restrict, or they would ban abortion, that, letting each local state make that decision. Uh, in Kentucky, one of those laws was, was passed by our state legislature. A federal judge has overruled that this week. And I understand that uh, during the week, uh, that uh, the Roe v. Wade was overturned. There was like 200 abortions that were not performed in the two clinics in Louisville. Uh, those have been performed now by, by this one judge's ruling. In an effort to curb that, uh, the state legislature has an amendment that's going to be on the ballot in November. Uh, this ballot is that it, it simply states that the, the, the right of abortion is not in the Constitution of Kentucky. And so they're just asking if you agree that the Constitution, the Constitution gives a right to privacy, but they're taking that interpreting that a right to privacy is a right to kill the preborn. And so one of the ways they're, they're doing that in Kentucky is that this amendment uh, will s simply state that the Constitution of Kentucky does not afford the right of abortion on, on demand. And so that will be one of the uh, uh, amendments on the Constitution November. Educate yourself on that. Be studying up on that. Uh, be sure you vote. Uh, there's another amendment coming up. Uh, we all complained because when uh, COVID hit, uh, the churches were shut down. The governor declared a state of emergency. Uh, the state legislature's hands were tied. We were all saying, surely there's something the elected officials could do. They couldn't. Uh, that other amendment simply says that the state legislatures during a a time of emergency, the state legislature can call themselves back into session. That will be an amendment that will be on the Constitution, uh, an amendment to the Constitution that will be on the ballot in November. Again, educate yourself on these things. Be prepared to vote. Go vote in November when those come up. Uh, another thing I need to announce to you, we're going to begin collecting water. Uh, this is bottled water and water by the gallon jugs. Uh, they're needing this in Marion. This is going to be a long-term situation in Marion. Uh, the old city lake, at, as I said, as of last Thursday, had like a five-day supply of water. Uh, when that's gone, it's gone. And so they're doing a lot of conservation efforts. They're asking uh, that uh, on Thursdays and Fridays uh, that they're handing out water to the citizens. This is bottled water and the gallon jugs. And I think they're doing some five-gallon jugs. We're going to collect bottled water and gallon jugs here uh, I'll take that each week, what we have to get it to them. They're also asking for volunteers on Thursdays and Fridays to help in the distribution. Uh, the Kentucky Baptist Disaster Relief is on the ground. Uh, Ron Crow, director of Kentucky Baptist Disaster Relief, is, has been in Marion this week. Uh, Brother Rodney has had to go to, uh, or didn't have to, but he's on a mission trip in um, Puerto Rico. And uh, he just asked that because this is a Kentucky Baptist statewide disaster working in Marion for our churches to please be involved. So see me after the service. Uh, it's on the Kentucky Baptist website or you can call the city hall in Marion. Either way, if you're available to help, 
uh, any shift on a Thursday or Friday, a morning or a afternoon. Uh, and, and I can help you a little more of what that's not not a whole lot of doing, just they need bodies to be there to help distribute this, and then we need to bring it into the church to get it there. Um, I think that's all I've got on my lengthy little list. Um, have I left anything out, announce what my wise? All right. I think I've covered it all, Joe. If you would, come and lead us in a time of worship, brother. We're glad you're back. We missed you last week. Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries this morning? Happy birthday. Anniversary. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Amen. <coughs> Thank God that we live in America. Land of the free and and we just got to be careful to uh, where our land is today and just keep our eyes focused on God. But let's sing, uh, my eyes have seen the glory. And uh, just, uh, and before we do that, let's recognize the ones that have served our country. Would you stand up real quick, please? Amen. <laughs> You know, it took people to, just like them, to go and fight for our freedom to, to what we have today. Thank God for our freedom, and thank God that we can come into this place and worship without being scared. But my eyes have seen the glory. Let's sing this out.
going to sound good this morning. Soon and very soon. away from us, don't it? It's crazy how quick time goes by. It sure is. Brother Mike, would you take us to the Lord at this time, brother? Precious God, worthy heaven, and Father, we thank you and praise you and glorify your holy, righteous, and wondrous name. We thank you for the gift of your Son, for his blood, for our sins, and for your willingness to come to earth and suffer for us. Lord, be with this service, be with those listening. Lord, help them hear the word of God and let it come from the message to their heart and bring them together with us so that we can praise you together so they can be nourished and so we can nourish one another. Forgive us all our sins, dear Lord, and draw us to you. We praise you and lift you up and glorify your name that the world may know who you are and be and, and receive to you, to you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Mike. You know, it was good to spend some time with my dad uh, the last couple weeks, actually, and uh, and everything. But 
You know, it's good to be with family and friends and to be with family and friends, and we need to do that. But you know, in the absence of being here and all the craziness in the world, this song that we're going to do next, we hadn't done this song in a long time, but my God, that was just like, they were doing their own thing. I didn't care if they waited on me or what, but I just was being saturated with this song, and and I thought, we've got to do this. And uh, it's the air, this is the air that I breathe. It's the song it is, but just let the Holy Spirit saturate you this morning and, and fill you as, as we sing this song. before you we are lost Lord without you and Lord there's nothing that satisfies the worldly things do not satisfy us but we think they do it's always temporary but God as you fill us with your spirit there's nothing like that 
and we can only receive that from you. Lord, you tell us in your word that if you stand at a man's heart and knocks, and if he will open up to you, Lord, that you will come into him. And Lord, there's nothing like that. God, with all the craziness and all the things that's going on in this world that can distract us from you, that can pull us away from you, it's not worth it, Lord. God, you stick closer to us than a brother. You're always with us, Lord. Always pricking our heart and trying to guide us this way. If we go the other way, Lord. Your sweet spirit wooing and drawing us back. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, God, for that. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for each and every one that's here today, Lord. I pray a special blessing upon each and every one here, Lord, and everyone that's watching the internet. Fill their homes with the Spirit of God. Thank you for our country, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we have. God, we thank you for that. Blessed be your name. Just fill us with your Holy Spirit today. God, be with Brother Danny, Lord. Fill him with the words, Lord, that you'd have him to speak to us today. Anoint him, Father, from the top of his head to the very sole of his feet. And Lord, we bless your holy name in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask if you'd open your Bibles to the book of Joshua. If you open your Bibles in the Old Testament, you've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then the book of Joshua. This is the 4th of July weekend, Independence Day. When you think of Independence Day, the 4th of July, I think one of the most common words that comes to mind is freedom. Our freedoms, our freedoms in America, if you've... Uh, ever been to another country or read about other countries or studied other countries, you know that America was founded on freedom and freedoms that we have. And so um, when we think about our freedoms and uh, we think about our Father God, how many of you knew my dad? Anybody know my dad? I didn't think so. Um, I love to hear stories about my dad. I work around the Amish a lot. A lot of the older Amish knew my dad. And so when I'm out in the Amish community and I meet one of the older guys and he hears my name and he said, oh, are you Carl's son? I, yeah, I'm Carl's son. And then he begins to tell me stories that I didn't know about Carl. And uh, that wouldn't mean anything to you. It would mean very little to you because you didn't know Carl. But to me, those stories are important. That's my family. Uh, my family, uh, I love to hear stories about my family, my family history uh, as a Christian. And we should love to hear stories about our family, our father, uh, those uh, relatives uh, before us. Joshua was one of our relatives, uh, one of those that uh, our father uh, had to do a very important job. You read the book of Genesis and you read about the creation God created everything. God created the whole world, everything that you see. It says everything visible and invisible. And he created Adam and Eve and he put them in a garden. And then Satan, the devil, he came along and he uh, began to tell them uh, to put doubt in their minds. And, and if, if you've been around church much, you've been in uh, Bible school or you've been in Sunday school, you've heard the story. You know uh, what happened in the family. Uh, sin entered the picture. Adam and Eve sinned, and Adam and Eve had to leave the garden. But before they left the garden, in the process of leaving the garden, in the process of, of what sin did and all that sin brought, all the death and sickness and destruction and decay, all of that that came, uh, God said he would send a redeemer. He would send uh, his son. He didn't name his son at the time, but he said he would, he would fix it. Kind of like a father does sometimes. He tells his kid, I'll fix it. And so God said he would fix it. And so as we began reading, continue reading the history in the book of Genesis and then over in Exodus, uh, God establishes a people for himself. 
Now, through Abraham. Abraham and Sarah didn't have children and God said he was going to make Abraham the father of many nations. And through Abraham, God would establish a people for himself. And that people, as we continue to read Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, we find that that people is what we know as the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And so God established through Abraham that the Jews would be his people. And that was... In the family, uh, that if you flip through the photo album, that's a picture of the family. Uh, the Israelites, the Jewish people in the Old Testament is kind of like the black and white pictures of, of the family a long time ago. And we, we see the old pictures of the family that many times we may not really recognize those people, but we know their family because we've been told their family. And so we look at the black and white pictures in the Old Testament and we see the Jews, the Israelites, and we recognize, well, that's our family. And so God deals with the family God has people like Moses. God has people like Aaron. God has people like Joshua that are in the family and that deal with the family that become leaders of the family. And we read the story as we read Genesis, we read Exodus, we read Leviticus. We, we read the story of the family. The family, well, the family's not always, uh, how can we say this? They're not always the, the most stellar of characters. Uh, we've got some people in the family that we're not quite proud of. And they get in trouble a lot. Uh, they, they, they're told what to do and they don't do it. Uh, they're told not to do something and they do that and, and they get in trouble. And, and so God is the father as we read the story. If, if we look at the, the photo album, if you will, we, we see that God punishes the kids, Israel. And in fact, they, they're, they're taken away captive we, we read in, the, in the, the family album, the Bible, the book. We look at the pictures. We see that they're taken captive down into Egypt. They've had to go down there because of a famine, because they, they were going to starve to death. And God arranged for them to go down there through Joseph. And he arranges for the family to be taken care of. And then they stay there for some 400 odd years. And God sends Moses to bring them out. And they're kind of, again, not exactly the best behaved family. And so God tells them what they have to do or he's going to punish them. And we read they don't do what God says. And so God punishes them. And in the end, God sends Moses to bring them out. You remember this story about the family? Moses brings the family out of Egypt and the, 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 the Egyptians are chasing the family and the fact the whole army and they come to the Red Sea. You remember that story, a miraculous story of how they, they get to the Red Sea and you, you hear the old expression, they're between the devil and the deep blue sea. Uh, they're between the Egyptians and, and the Red Sea and, and God through Moses parts the waters and they cross and they, they get across and now it seems like they're delivered. That's great. The family's finally experiencing freedom from the Egyptian slavery. But the family's still just not the best behaved. And so because they don't behave, they end up having to wander in a wilderness, in a forest, in a desert for some 40 years they have to wander. And Moses is the leader, the one that brought them out. And, and even the leader gets into trouble with his attitude. You know, some of the family just have a problem with attitudes. Not me, but some of the family, you know. They just have, they have attitude problems. And, and Moses gets an attitude problem. And so God tells Moses... He's going to let the family cross the Jordan River. They're going to go into the promised land, but he tells Moses, you're not going to get to take them. And so we read in Deuteronomy that Moses is going to die. He's not going to get to go. Boy, that's a sad part. I've always thought that was the saddest part of the family history, that Moses didn't get to go. But Joshua is going to lead him over. And so Joshua does. Joshua leads them across the Jordan River into the promised land. And it's a great time. The people are doing pretty good. And we read the book of Joshua. We read all of the accounts of how God the Father had told the family if they behave, they're going to get to own all of the land. And so they pretty well behave for several years. They, they do drive out all of the enemies. They, they encamp all of the land. They, they do a good job. And then as we read through the book of Joshua, there comes a time now that Moses has died, Abraham has died, Joseph has died. All the people we know in the family have died. It's kind of what happens in families. 
And now we come to Joshua chapter number 23, Joshua chapter number 24, and now Joshua is dying. But just before Joshua dies, as we're flipping through the photo album, as we're reading the family history, Joshua calls all the family together. And Joshua begins to talk to the family in chapter 23 and chapter 24. And he begins to tell the family if they, if they choose to follow Jehovah God, if they choose to follow God the creator that they've known about all the way back Genesis to the garden to the creation, if they, if they follow him and obey him, just like God had told Moses, like God had told Abraham, like God had told all of the family leaders before, if you obey me, you're, it's going to be pretty good for you. And if you don't, have you ever told your kids that? <laughs> if, if you listen to me, it's going to be pretty good. But if you don't, you've got a rough go. It's going to get tough if you don't listen. And sure enough, as kids, we sometimes don't listen and we have to experience mom and dad probably knew better, knew best. And so it, it gets rough. And so Joshua... He's an old man now. Joshua comes to the point that he's, he knows he's about to die. All the way up before with the family, we always knew before one of the, the leaders in the family died, we always were told who was going to take over next. We, you know, we always knew after Abraham, we knew who was going to take over. And, and after Isaac, we knew who was going to take over. And after, after Moses, we knew who was going to take over. And after Joshua, we knew who was going to take over. And now Joshua's about to die and as we read the book, we don't know who's fixing to take over. We don't know what's fixing to happen. The family is, is, is really at a, a crossroads. The family has a, a place of decision. And Joshua begins to tell them, if you choose God, you're going to have some freedoms. You're going to have some things you're going to enjoy. You're going to have some blessings. Over across the the Jordan over across the, the other river, the Euphrates River, he says, the, your, your fathers had other gods. He uses the two terms, Jehovah and Elohim. If you read this in the, in, in the, the King's English, uh, the Hebrew talks about Jehovah. Jehovah, the creator God, the God, the one God of heaven that created heaven and earth. That's Jehovah. But Joshua also says there were other gods that your family had, your fathers had. Those were little G-O-D-S's. Those were little gods. Anything you put before Jehovah can be a god. And if you let those things be your gods, then Jehovah is just going to take his hands off and tell you, go for it. But the blessings of Jehovah God won't be there. And so as Joshua is getting ready to die, Joshua chapter 23 I generally have you to stand for the reading of God's word, but this whole thing to this morning is God's word because we're just going to read what God says through the hand of Joshua. And I want to put a little, a little insight into some of it. We're going to read Joshua 23 beginning at 14, and then we're going through 24. And this is a, a talk Joshua's having with all the family, with Israel, the nation of Israel. He calls them together. And I can just kind of picture because they didn't have microphones back then that he, he calls them into to a valley where he's seated on a, a hillside and he says it where all the leaders are out in front of them in such a way that they can all hear as he talks. And he begins to tell them. And, 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 and this is his farewell speech. He's, he's, he's saying, I'm dying. You're going to have new leadership. You've been blessed of God over here in this land, this Canaan land, this promised land. But now you've got to make a decision. And as I read the family history, it, it reminds me how sometimes family histories are kind of cyclical. They, they, just, they, they, they just repeat over and over. You know, kind of generational, how things kind of repeat in families. You've noticed some families are very well financial, and it seems like it goes from generation to generation to generation. You've noticed some families are not so well off, and it seems like it kind of goes generation to generation. Some families are, are in a certain line of work, a certain career, a certain uh, path that that family has chosen, and that seems to go generation to generation. And, and then other times it, it seems like they're just you know, those families are just kind of scattered. And that's the way it is with God's family. And Joshua comes to this point that the family has got to make a decision now. And as I was reading that, I was thinking of us 
as the American family. We've been blessed. I mean, if, if nothing else, you've got to admit, we have been blessed as a nation. We have had freedoms. We have had prosperity. We have, I mean, even the poorest of us is so much better off than people in other parts of the world where they just starve. And Joshua's talking to the family and he says, I'm, I'm about to die, but you've got to make some decisions. Now, as I said a while ago, the Old Testament is kind of a black and white photo album. The New Testament's kind of more in color. But God never changes. God's the same. God was the same back at, before the creation when he spoke all of, this, all of this world and everything we see into existence. That, it's the same God. He had, he had the same love for, for man back then, for Adam and Eve to be their, 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 their God father, their creator, as he does for us today. And so God gives us this picture of the family of Israel, of the Jewish people. And, and while the church doesn't replace Israel, doesn't replace the Jewish people, in the New Testament time, in, in the era after Christ, the church is God's chosen people, just like Israel was God's chosen people. The, the Christians, those that accept God as, as their God. And so when God told Israel, I'll bless you if you do this and though, and, and then he said, if you don't, if you disobey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take those blessings away. As a matter of fact, he said, I'm going to curse you. God deals with the church much the same way today. God says, I'll bless you. I'll protect you. I'll take care of you if you obey. And if you don't, I'll remove my hand of protection. I'll remove my hand of blessing. You see, God deals with individuals differently than he deals with groups, differently than he deals with nations. The grace of Jesus covers our sin. I understand that. God's judgment is not, not always immediate, not always, you know, you, you sin, God doesn't just reach down and zap you with a bolt of lightning and send you to hell right then. That's that, the grace of Jesus covers. But as far as nations go, God judges nations. Throughout history, God has judged groups differently than he does individuals. And so is the American family today. I think God, it, America certainly did not replace Israel. But I think America has been as blessed as Israel was throughout their history. And yet when you look at the history of Israel, you look at the history of the Jewish people, for their disobedience, they suffered greatly. When you read the history of the Jewish people, when they were down in Egypt, they suffered as slaves. When, when the Jewish people, take it all the way back up to some of your lifetimes, the, the Jewish people in the 1940s under the Holocaust, the Jewish people suffered tremendously and the only way you can interpret that is because of their actions, God had removed his hand of blessing. And we read it sometimes as secular history, but we have to be careful and not separate secular history from biblical history and God's history and God's people. And so while the Americans, us, has been blessed, we're at a crossroads. We're kind of at the place Israel was, I think, when Joshua died. And it's up to the preachers, the church, to sound the warning. Happened that way in Nehemiah's time. It's happened throughout history. There's been times when it's a point of decision. And I think America is at a point of decision. And you and I as Americans, you and I as Christians, we have to make a choice. Israel was at a point in their history where they had to make a choice. And so we read the family history. We, we, we look at the, the, the photo album of the Bible and we see how God dealt with them. And then that helps us to see how God's dealing with us. So as Americans at a point of crossroads, as Christians at a point of crossroads, you look where we are in America. Some of the decisions that we're making some of the sermons that I heard as a teenager many, many years ago of things that were going to happen, prophetic things preachers would say were going to happen, I literally am watching those things being fulfilled today. When you would talk about men marrying men, women marrying women, and the, the Bible simply says that's against God's plan for man and woman. 
And yet we live in a country where we accept that. When you talk about killing children before they're born, I mean, science has, take all of the, 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 the questions out of it, uh, take, break it down to its simplest. One of the things that the, the states are dealing with is this 15 week issue when the heartbeat is detectable. It's, you know, I, I can remember as a teenager when abortion was brought up and the issue was, you know, of a viable, we call it a fetus, didn't call it a child when you had the heartbeat. And then we come up with the thing of the ultrasound. Back then, you didn't even have ultrasounds. They have ultrasounds. We, we have 3D and now 4D ultrasounds. I have a picture of our latest grandson on the refrigerator still that was taken of him. I don't remember how many months it was, but before he was born. And it's amazing the features that you can see with these ultrasounds. And yet, as Americans, we're at the point today where not only are we discussing abortion and the caveats for rape or incest, we're, we're talking abortions up to, up to the day before a natural birth. And we have people that are, are, are demanding that. And as I said a while ago, what the Roe v. Wade decision, what our court has just done is they didn't do away with abortion. They just simply said, this is a state issue. It's not a federal issue. The state needs to decide. And we have people threatening to kill Supreme Court justices over that. We have people burning centers down that all those centers do is take care of pregnant women that find themselves in a crisis situation and need help if they choose to have the baby. And we have people burning those businesses, those places down. We have people marching in the streets and rioting for the right to kill children. We have politicians that are standing and saying that they need to protest. And it all goes back to this right of privacy. We are at a place in America, much like Israel found them place, themselves at a crossroads. And you go on and on with the issues. The things that we're looking, I mean, you could even take it down to the stuff on clean energy and, and the stuff that leaders are, are demanding. We have some decisions to make. And so Joshua called the family together and Joshua reminded the people all the way back to Genesis that God is our father. And there are other gods, little G-O-Ds, and we have to make a decision who we're going to follow. And then Joshua sums it up by saying that there's freedoms that come, there's privileges that come, there's blessings that come from choosing God to be your God. And he had led the people, he was there when they left Egypt. He was there when they crossed the Red Sea. He was there when they murmured and complained in the desert. He was there when Moses got mad at him and hit the rock and Moses wasn't allowed to go into the promise. He had watched all of this. And so in chapter 23, in verse 14, he, he addresses the people. And, and this is again in the Bible because God says it's important for us to see it in 2022 to see how God dealt with them all the way back in 3,000 B.C., somewhere in that range, 4,000. Joshua says, I am now going the way of the whole earth. I'm going to die. I'm not going to be here. And you know with all of your heart and all of your soul that none of the good promises the Lord your God made to you has failed. If God said he would do it, he did it, and we've seen it. He's done it. Everything was fulfilled for you. Not one promise has failed. Since every good thing the Lord your God promised you has come about, so he will bring on you every bad thing until he has annihilated you from this good land the Lord your God has given you. God said, if you obey, I'll bless you, and he's blessed us. And God also said, if we disobey, there would be curses, and we've been cursed. You've seen it all. If you break the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and you go and serve other gods and bow and worship to them, 
The Lord's anger will burn against you and you will quickly disappear from this good land he has given you. Now, that is Joshua speaking to the family, Israel. And he said, you've seen when you've obeyed and God's blessed. and You've seen when you disobeyed and God's cursed. And I'm telling you, if you disobey, it's going to get rough on you. And as you go through the book of Judges, you go through the rest of the Old Testament, you see that the Israeli people, the Jewish people, they continued to disobey. In fact, you come all the way to the New Testament and you find it was the Jewish people, it was those people that demanded that Jesus, the Son of God, be crucified. They demanded that of the Roman government. That's how far away they got. It was those Jewish people because of disobedience. And I know this is not popular to say, but from 1941 to 1945, thousands of them were gassed in the chambers in Germany by a madman. But it was because God had removed his hand of protection. Everything physical has a spiritual correlation. If you don't believe it, live long enough. Just sit and watch. If you believe it's foolishness, matter of fact, the Bible said it would be foolishness to the unbeliever. The Bible said preaching would be foolishness to the unbeliever. I can't tell you the people that I have watched that have mocked when preachers have said, and yet they live long enough, they watch it come to pass. I told you all ago, as a teenager, I sat under the sermons, prophetic sermons, of things that were going to happen in this country if we didn't do certain things, and those things are happening. I'm sure the people that lived in the 1930s never thought this nation could go through a Great Depression as prosperous as this nation had been, but they did. You know, we want to think to ourselves right now, we could never get there again. God help us. Israel probably thought it would never happen to them. Joshua said, you better pay attention. God put it in the Bible. God put it there. You can laugh at him. You can dismiss him. You can say you don't believe in him. You can shake your fist at him. People have the world over all of history. They've shaken their fist at God. And they have paid the price. Hell is yawning for those people that shake their fist in the face of God. Israel shook their fist in the face of God. They were Abraham's children, they were God's chosen. How dare the world? And yet when God removes his hand of blessing, and so all of scripture is for us to study. All of scripture is for us to discern. And we can dismiss it. We can say it's not true. We can burn it. But that doesn't change who God is. Everything that God said would happen, happened. And Joshua is reminding the family Israel, all of the good promises God made, you have enjoyed. But if you thumb your nose at God, and remember, America doesn't replace Israel, but God has not changed the same character that God is. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when God deals with America, America will go the way of Israel when America makes the decisions and the choices to thumb their nose at God. When you get to chapter 24, you just flip the page, the same speech. Joshua had said, I'm dying. You have a choice to make. I'm not going to be here. 
I think in some ways Joshua was probably saying, my race is run. I'm going the way of the earth. I'm going to be with the Father. I'm going to where the promises will be fulfilled. But you still have decisions to make. In chapter 1 of verse 20, chapter 24, Joshua basically sets out the choice. And now the transition goes from Israel to you. To the Christian, in 2022, you have a choice to make. Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem and summoned Israel's elders, leaders, judges, and officers, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all of the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Joshua says, this is not my words, it's God's words. And I say to you today, this is not my words. This is God's words. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods, little G-O-Ds. But I took your, this is God speaking, but I took your father Abraham from the region beyond the Euphrates River, led him throughout the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave the hill country of Seir to Esau as a possession. Jacob and his sons, however, went down to Egypt. I sent Moses and Aaron. This is all history that is provable, not just Bible, but extra biblical literature. This is world history. I sent Moses and Aaron and I defeated Egypt by what I did within it. You remember the plagues? And afterward, I brought you out. And when I brought your fathers out of Egypt and you reached the Red Sea, the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen as far as the sea. Your fathers cried out to the Lord. So he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea over them, engulfing them. Your own eyes saw what I did to Egypt. Now this is Israel's history. We could take America's history. We could go back to the Revolutionary War in 1776. We could go back to the the War of 1812. We could go back to the Civil War. We could go back to World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan. We could see American history just like they're reading, hearing, God saying, this is the family history. Sometimes I've blessed you and seen you through it. And sometimes I've taken my hands off and I've let them fly planes into your buildings. It's history. Now, ours isn't written in the Bible because the Bible closed in the days of Jesus. But you can read U.S. history. You can read world history. And you have one of two choices. Either there's a God in heaven or there's not. And if there's not, let's fold up and go home. It's all worthless, useless. But if there is a God in heaven... What I'm saying to you today has consequences, eternal consequences. And if there's not a God in heaven, who cares? What's it matter? I'm just blowing smoke and it don't matter. You're going to end and be dust and it's done. But if I'm right, if there is a God in heaven, there are eternal consequences known as heaven and hell. And if you're right and I'm wrong, so what? We both turn to worm food. But if I'm right and you're wrong, I go to heaven, you go to hell. Some pretty weighty matters. Joshua was basically saying the same thing I'm saying to you today. You've got to make a decision. And so here's where he cuts it down. Go to verse 14. We'll skip through the history of how God protected Israel, how God gave them the promised land, how God drove out all of their enemies. And then we get to verse 14 and Joshua makes it very personal. If you're right, I'm wrong, we both become worm food. It doesn't matter. If I'm right and you're wrong, I go to heaven, you go to hell for all eternity. So Joshua says, God says, the word of God says in verse 14, therefore, because of all that you've seen God do, because of world history, 
fear the Lord and worship him in sincerity and truth. Get rid of the gods of your fathers. Look at what God is saying. I know you're still worshiping all these other things and I've been patient about it. I haven't zapped you yet. But you need to worship the Lord. You need to make a choice. Joshua says, see Jehovah God. Look at your lives. Look at history. Understand what Jehovah has done. Understand what creator God has done. Come to the realization. Come to the point in your life where you make the decision. Either he is or he isn't. Either you choose him or you reject him. Joshua says in verse 15, if it doesn't please you to worship the Lord, choose for yourselves today which you will worship. The gods of your fathers, the ones that were worshiped beyond the Euphrates River. You want to worship yourself, your fun, your entertainment. You want to worship the golf course. You want to worship your car. You want to worship pleasure. You want to worship what feels good for the moment? Do it. It's your choice. Joshua says, as for me. Remember, he's dying. I mean, what, how much more important can something get than coming from a man that is dying? It's done. He is either about to stand before the creator of the universe, God, Jehovah, or he's about to become worm food. And he says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to worship the Lord. So Joshua sets the alternatives. If you think it's wrong to serve God, don't serve him. It's your choice. But this is the decision I'm making. And in verse number 16, the people tell him, we will certainly not abandon the Lord to worship other gods. For the Lord our God brought us out of the fa our fathers, out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery, and performed these great signs before our eyes. He protected us all along the way. We went among the peoples whose lands we traveled through. The Lord drove out before us all of the people, including the Amorites, who lived in the land. We will worship the Lord because he is our God. We've seen it. We've watched it. We've seen him give us the land. We're going to worship him. And you would think that's great news. And Joshua said the same thing Moses said to them in Deuteronomy 31 and Deuteronomy 32. You can't do it. You're a stiff-necked people. You're proud. You're arrogant. You think you're smarter than everybody else. You just said this because you think it's what I want to hear. You just said it to get the preacher to shut up. You just did it because everybody else did it. I'm not saying this. The Bible's saying this, folks. Verse 19 and 20, Joshua told the people, you will not be able to worship the Lord because he is a holy God. He's a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions and your sins. If you abandon the Lord and worship foreign gods, he will turn against you, harm you, and completely destroy you after he's been good to you. What kind of a God is that? And in verse 21, the people says, no, we will worship the Lord. And in verse 22, it's as if a judge in front of a court, Joshua tells the people, you are witnesses against yourself. You've just sworn before God that you're going to do it, and I'm telling you, you won't. Joshua told the people, verse 22, your witnesses against yourselves, that yourselves have chosen to worship the Lord, and they said, we are witnesses. Now, that sounds a little awkward. And verse 22 and 23, Joshua told the people, your witnesses against yourselves, that yourselves have chosen to worship the Lord. And the people said, we are witnesses, so be it. We swear before God. And Joshua says, and it's, it's, it's as if it changes from the first person 
So the author God himself directly addresses the reader. In verse number 23, it's as if time is intersected. It's as if the Bible goes between the time of the Israelis and Joshua's death and the Bible comes to 2022 and it asks you a question. If you know world history, you know the history of Israel. And now it's your decision time. Get rid of the foreign gods that are among you and turn your hearts to the Lord God of Israel. This is your decision. You choose God this day or it's done, it's settled. So the people said to Joshua, verse number 24, we will worship the Lord our God and obey him. And on that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people at Shechem and established a statute and ordinance for them. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. That's what you're reading right now. And he also took a large stone and he set it up under the oak at the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, you see this stone right here? He built a monument outside of their, their church. And he said, this rock is going to be a witness against us. For it's heard all of the words the Lord said to us, and it will be a witness against you so that you will not deny your God. Every time you go in to make sacrifice in the temple, in the tabernacle, every time you see this rock, it's going to remind you that you said you'd worship God. And every time you sin and you don't, this rock is going to be a reminder. I'm dying. I'm, going to, I'm either going to God or I'm going to be worm food, but I'm leaving this rock here. And every time you look at this rock, every time you drive by a church, Every time you see a cross, you just remember God said, I'm God and you're not. And you've got a decision to make. What's that, what's that choice? What are you going to do? And in verse 28, Joshua sent the people away, each to his own inheritance. And after these things, the Lord's servant Joshua, son of Nun, died at the age of 110 they buried him in his allotted territory at Timnath Sarah in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Israel worshiped the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime. And during the lifetimes of the elders who outlived Joshua and who had experienced all the works the Lord had done for Israel, Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the parcel of the land Jacob had purchased from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of silver. It was an inheritance for Joseph's descendants. And Eleazar, this is a priest under Joshua. Eleazar, son of Aaron, died, and they buried him at Gilbia, which had been given to the sons of Phinehas, another priest, in the hill country of Ephraim. And that's kind of important because Phineas was a priest and the priest, the Levitical priest, could not own property. But Phineas owned the property that was used for the cemetery to bury his co-priest. And that right there tells us that they had already began turning away from the laws and the rules of God because the Levitical priest already began to own property and the Levitical law said they could not. And that's written in there for us to see this is the beginning of the downfall of Israel. Even though they said they would follow God in their heart, they chose that they wouldn't. And you keep reading as you go over to the book of Judges and you find that they did not follow the Lord that they were witnesses to. All of that, all of that real quick history and I know to some it's boring. But it's there for us to see that we are at the point that we make a choice. Either serve God or serve the world. Moses told the people they couldn't. And they couldn't. Joshua told the people that they couldn't. And they couldn't. That kind of sounds hopeless. What kind of a God would do that. And as you continue reading the Old Testament, you continue reading the minor prophets, the major prophets, 
and you come all the way over to the New Testament, you begin to find that man tried and tried and tried and man never could get to God. Because just like Moses said, you're a stiff-necked people, you can't do it. Joshua said, you're a stiff-necked people, you can't do it. And God was saying, there's only one way you can. And we read through all of that bloody history to get to the book of Matthew. And as the book of Matthew opens, you find the birth of a baby. Amen. You find a promise that was made all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 when God said, I will send a redeemer. And 4,000 years later, God intersects time and history and the Redeemer is born. And we're asked to make a choice, serve God or serve the world. Is there a God? Read world history. Joshua told Israel, you look at all that God has done, everything he said he would do, he did. You look at American history, everything God said he would do, he did. Look at the history in your own life, your own family, those that have served God. The difference, the difference with Israel when Moses said, you can't, you can't live for God. When Joshua said, you can't, you can't live for God is when Matthew opens and Jesus comes and Jesus pays that penalty that God imposed on sin, and that is death. But Jesus said something. Just before his death, he said, I will not leave you alone. I will send a comforter. How do you live the Christian life? How do you do it? It's only by the gift of what we just celebrated on Pentecost. Look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. Paul talking to the church, the church that tried and tried, a very carnal church, a church that lived for the world. And Paul says in Galatians 5 and 16, I say then, how do you do this? How, if there is a God, how do you live for him? I say then, walk by the Spirit, capital S-P-I-R-T. When you're born again, you recognize your loss. The Holy Spirit convicts you that you're lost. You need to be saved. You ask God to forgive you of your sins. And when God forgives you of your sins because of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, and Jesus said, it's necessary that I go away because if I don't go away, the Father can't send the promise. The Father can't send the comforter. The Father can't send the capital S-P-I-R-T. And Paul says, I say then, walk by the Spirit you now have when you get born again, when you're adopted into the family, you're grafted into the family, you now have the spirit that lives in your heart. That third part of the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Father is the creator, God the Son is the redeemer that died on the cross of Calvary, and God the Spirit that comes to live in your heart the day you ask God to forgive you of your sins. And Paul says, walk by the Spirit and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. How do you choose God? You recognize that you're a sinner. You need to be saved. You ask God to forgive you. So how do you do that? How do you live that every day? By the spirit, that third part of the triune God. Paul says, I say then walk by the spirit and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. If the Bible could keep you from sinning, Israel would not have sinned. Israel knew the Bible, the Bible that they had. They didn't have the New Testament, but they knew the, the first five books. They, that, that was their history. They knew it. But God only enables us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so you come to the place where you have to make a choice. Is there a God? And if there is a God, what are you going to do with him? 
If you say, well, not today. I've got too many things going on. I'm not, not today. You've made a choice. You've made a choice. If you choose to wait, you've made a choice. Just as much as if you say there is no God. We're at a place in America. We're at a place in our lives, every person, to make a choice. Choose you this day who you will serve. If it seems evil to you to serve God, so be it. But as for me in my house, says the dying declaration of an old man, 110 years old. As for me in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. If you're right and I'm wrong, we'll just be worm food. If I'm right and you're wrong, I go to heaven. Where are you going? Joe, come and lead us in a hymn of invitation. As you stand, some singing, some praying. If the Holy Spirit's talking to you, I encourage you to be praying. What's the Holy Spirit, Danny? Well, if there's a still small voice in your mind telling you you need to pray and ask God for forgiveness, that's the Spirit. That's the convicting power of the Spirit. If that still small voice is saying you need to do something today, you need to pray, you need to go up front, you need to talk to somebody, be obedient. Listen to what he says. Joshua told the people, you need to listen. There's grave consequences in this. If he's talking to you this morning, I'm done. I've said all I'm going to say. Now it's you and him. are you making? What's that still small voice asking you to do? You're going to choose God? You're going to say there is no God? It's just you and Him right now. Christ is Savior, if you're listening by way of internet, if you're in the room today, I pray this is not your last chance. I've been in services before when we were having the altar call and, and an outdoor meeting. And the sheriff drive up in the back. And the sheriff come up and tell a family member that their loved one had been killed in a car wreck. That loved one wasn't saved. I went to that funeral. I watched that family grieve that loss. Life is short. Hell is real. We all have a decision to make. I pray this is not your last chance if you chose today just to choose not, just to not make a decision. If you know that you're saved, you know that you know that you know that you'll go to heaven when you die. That's just like Joshua. He, he says, I'm going the way of, 
of everybody else of this earth. I'm going to die. I'm 110 years old. I'm going to stand before God. He knew where he was going to go. He had no doubt. But he was talking to a group of people that he loved and he knew some of them weren't going to make it. Every time I stand up here, I know I'm probably talking to some people that may not make it, especially now that we're on internet and it goes out and you never know who's going to see it. Not every message is a message to get saved or you're going to hell. Some, most messages today are encouraging messages. Most messages are talking to the church, encouraging the saints. But sometimes there's a message when God is saying there's somebody that's going to hear this that's lost and they're on their way to hell. I pray that you've done everything that you know to do. I stand before God knowing I've done everything I know to do. If you don't know that you know that you know and you don't come now, call me, call somebody. Reach out to somebody that you've got confidence in. Don't, don't risk it. Don't risk it. Consequences are too high. Joshua had no way of knowing what Israel was going to face in the future. He knew that if they didn't choose God, they were going to face the wrath of God, and he knew that wasn't good. I don't think there's any way Joshua could have imagined all that Israel was going to have to go through. I don't know what America's going to have to face. My God, I never thought we would face 9-11. I never thought this country would let its defenses down to that point. You never know as an individual what you're going to face. I mean, you get up and you're feeling fine and all of a sudden a sore throat, an ache here, an ache there, a doctor's appointment, and, and your whole world's turned upside down. You get in the car and just that quick, you're standing before God. And if you know him as Savior, that's grand and glorious. You're on your way to heaven. But if you don't, if you don't, with everything, I, everything in my fiber that believes, if you leave this world and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you will spend eternity in hell separated from God. Don't risk it. If somebody laughs at you, it... it you don't have to know all the answers. But man, to risk leaving this world and not having professed Christ as Savior, what a price, what a price. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your presence, the Holy Spirit's presence in this place. God, I thank you for every soul that was here today. God, I beg you for every soul that was here today. But God, I know that you're a gentleman. I've read enough. I've, I've seen enough to know that you won't force yourself on any of us. If there's one under the sound of my voice that doesn't know you in the full free pardon of sin... Before they pillow their head tonight, God, I pray that they just say, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. God, forgive me of my sins. God, to those that do follow you, I pray that you would encourage and strengthen them, help them to walk in the spirit, that they not have to fulfill the desires of the flesh. God, nowhere do you tell us, do you expect that we'll be perfect but you do expect that we will ask you for forgiveness. And because of the price you paid for us in the life of your son, Jesus Christ, you expect us to walk worthy of that. We don't have to know all the answers, but we have to know the one that does know the answers as our Savior. Thank you for our country. Thank you for our freedoms. We pray for our leaders. Pray for the leaders of our church. Pray for the decisions that we have to make. 
that we be a lighthouse in this community. God, what a sad thing if the churches, if the churches go away. What a sad thing to think of a sin-darkened world with no light. Help each of us to strive to be more like you in our daily walk. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.